As a culture, we like to live in the extremes, the all-in mentality. But if we ever stop to think how often sustainable results are found in the center, Dr. Jamie Shear is a naturopathic doctor and registered dietitian and is here this week to share her advice on sustainability being the key to our success in all areas of life. This is the No Excuse to Miss podcast. Welcome to the No Excuse to Miss podcast. I am your host, Scott Volkortson, and this week's guest is coming on just at the right time. It's a new year, and for many, that means setting those resolutions with health and wellness always being at the top of the list. There's no better person to get started on the right track for this year than Dr. Jamie Shear. She is a nationally recognized expert in integrative medicine and nutrition. She holds dual licenses as a naturopathic physician and registered dietitian, making her one of the few practitioners in the country with both. Her philosophy is that health and wellness is highly individualized, and what works for one does not work for all. So I'm excited about this one. Welcome to the show, Dr. Jamie Shear. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. It's um, We've not ever actually met or spoke, so this is really exciting for me to have a, an opportunity to meet somebody. No, new I, and to um, dive into I think I told you subjects. my initial, when I reached out to you, I heard you on another podcast. Yeah. And the one thing that I kept taking away was your approach, like with sustainability Mm-hmm. Because so many times, like in the fitness and health space, it's so dogmatic that you have to do this or you have to do that. Yeah. And I th- and I think that prevents a lot of people from ever seeing results or success. It also prevents a lot of people from living their life, right? Because it takes us out of reality so often when we find ourselves in that sort of extreme pendulum of restriction or permission or can have, can't have. Um, so, you know, there's, there's so many elements of it, but I think if we were to just dive right into it, you know, the dogma and the rules, like they sell programs, people really do feel the need for that structure. And so I understand where it all comes from. And it's about finding the intersection of what those two things look like, right? How do we have structure and, defined goals and also still have the capacity for flexibility in life. And that's something that I have a lot of conversations with people is because I try to live relatively disciplined, but I've gotten better as I've gotten older to also try to live life at the same time. You know, I think it's interesting because discipline is arguably one of the biggest factors that drives success. Right. And, and well known in the athlete world and in the business, like discipline is important. But I think where we get confused is sort of this idea that discipline excludes flexibility. And that's just simply not true. Discipline allows for flexibility, as does consistency. I don't think that language is spoken well in the fitness and wellness world. I think we lose sight of what flexible means because whether it's out of fear of not hitting our goals or whether it's out of, you know, poor education around what makes us successful. There's this idea that if we don't do exactly the same thing all the time, every day in the way that it was written out, we can't possibly be successful. And in all my years of, of working in this industry um, at the highest level and in the day-to-day layperson level, like it is the person who has the discipline and the consistency that, that allows for flexibility that ultimately has the most success. And it's interesting because we think that, you know, what takes us 12 months, 18 months, five years to fall off and get to a certain point, we feel like in one day of not following a routine or a program, it's all gonna go to waste. Yeah, I mean, there's such a fear factor there, right? And whether we're talking about food or whether we're talking about fitness, wellness, anything, um, it, the longer you've been doing something, the more confidence that you have that you can get back to it. But as diet culture would have it, or you know, exercise culture, there's such a um, community of of worry around not being able to be consistent with something. And I'm going to go back to the same thing I've been saying, which is like the consistency will come from us being allowed to 
you know, make changes where we need to, right? What if, what if you can't go to the gym? What if you can't eat a certain food? What if you are traveling? I think, you know, we are all tethered to this idea of if I just stay on track and do it every day, I won't, I won't fail. And that's true for a short period of time. And I have like so many questions to get to, but you know, regarding that, but I guess I should digress and can I get a quick, or can you give our listeners a quick background of your, how you got into the nutrition space and how unique it is that you have both, you know, the dual licenses or dual certifications in both the naturopathic and registered yeah. dietitian, which doesn't always go hand in hand. No. And you're, you were spot on to say licenses. They're two different licensing boards. So my journey is, um, it is one that took many turns based off of kind of the conversation that we just started with, which is really seeking out some truth and figuring out what is, you know, the most important thing for us to be successful. So um, I've been an athlete my whole life and I knew early on that nutrition was a passion of mine. So as early as high school, I was like, I'm going to be a nutritionist, which is very rare. I realized um, it was a gymnast. So, you know, there was always nutrition embedded in my life. And I picked a school that I went to study nutrition as an undergrad. I then got an opportunity to be a nutritionist for the University of Nebraska football team, which at the time was when Eric Crouch had won the Heisman Trophy and it was a very big deal and Nebraska was, you know, all the rage. And so to have the opportunity to go out there as a nutritionist for their football team, because my, my passion and my love of sports nutrition was just, you know, mind blowing. And while I loved the school and I loved the, the program, I didn't love sports nutrition. And that was really hard for me to think like, I've always knew I wanted to practice nutrition, but here I am finishing up a bachelor's in a master's going for sports nutrition and I'm not happy with it. And, and what does that mean? And so that was a hard moment for me. And a lot of people will say, well, what didn't you love about it? And I really felt like the essence of health and wellness was missing. It was a lot of politics, understandably, that's what sports is, but I didn't have the chance to get in and change a life or influence a behavior. I sort of moved things around, you know, stocked Gatorade and, and made sure that like, you know, the kitchen was full, which is fantastic, but it wasn't, I wasn't getting from it what I wanted in, in regards to like working with an athlete and really feeling like I could make a change. So I moved back. I'm born and raised in New York. I moved back to New York and I started working in a clinic, um, in a hospital. It was called Elmhurst Hospital at the time in Queens, New York. And there I was diving out like 1200 milligram sodium diets and pre-diabetic diets. And like, I just was so unhappy, Scott. I was like, I have studied nutrition for six years. I love what I do. It's such a passion of mine, but how come I can't figure out how to make it work for me? Like something was missing. And I mean, whether you call it the universe or chance, I don't know. I had lunch with a friend that day and she was like, my, my naturopath fixed my acne. And I was like, hold on a second. What is a naturopath? I don't even know what that is. Never even heard of it. And how come somebody else out there in the world is practicing nutrition and treating acne? And I have dual certifications in nutrition and I don't know how to fix your acne. So I went home and, you know, Googled it and figured it out. And I was like, you mean, this is a doctorate program that licensed people to be physicians in integrative medicine. And it primarily focuses on diet and lifestyle and supplements. Like my mind was blown at the time. Like, how does this happen? So I immediately applied to uh, medical school to be a naturopath. I got accepted, decided I would start that journey. Not so sure that my family thought getting a doctorate after a bachelor's and a master's was the best idea, but I just, you know, forged forward um, and created an opportunity where I can learn all of those things. I have the chance to practice the integrative side of it while still having such a strong foundation in the science and nutrition side of things. Um, long story short, from there, I then got picked up to work in, at the time it was Beth Israel, now it's Mount Sinai. Um, I've had a journey there. I've been there for 17 years working as um, a nutritionist, integrative medicine doctor, teaching, educating physicians on how to talk about nutrition in their practices, teaching integrative medicine to residents and doctors and practicing nutrition in my own private practice. And here I am with you today. Well, that's awesome. And before I get into the questions, I just got to ask, as a girl from New York, 
Um, we're from Iowa, so I'm not saying this degrading to Nebraska at all, but I, I realize there's a big culture sw- uh, shock from New York to Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm-hmm. How how much was that hard for you to make that transition? It was brutal. I will say, <laughs> like, you know, all ego out the window right now. Like, I had no idea that cornfields were like, there were <laughs> ditches in between them. So, like, I definitely found myself falling and tripping and... Um, you know, the grocery store was really hard for me because people just take their time and, you know, the people be in front of me in the line, like writing out their check, asking the, you know, (laughs) the cashier about their day, all pleasantries and fantastic and the things that we want in the world. But coming from New York city and being like, what's happening right now? You know, like (laughs) it was, it was such culture shock to not have something at my fingertips at every moment to slow the pace of life to, you know, and it was just crazy. It was really, it was definitely a shock. And it's, it's gotten better now, like in the Midwest where we're at, but I would assume back then it was probably almost impossible to find like healthy eating options, whether at a restaurant or even the grocery stores back then. You know, I remember like a couple of the first times I'd go to Santa Monica or something, I'm like, there's all these health and wellness stores on every corner. There. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I was there that was, um, 2002 to 2004. So it was definitely before the boom of, you know, the natural markets and the whole foods and all the things, you know, thankfully, um, I was, I was insulated in this, you know, the, University of Nebraska has one of the most incredible sports nutrition programs in the country and what they feed their athletes is better than what I've seen any hospital feed an ill patient and I've never seen anything like it. So thankfully I had the opportunity to have all my meals in that, in the athletes arena at Nebraska, which I think allowed me to have some, some structure and not, and not go completely crazy with like, what were they called? Runzas or something? Uh, there's some sort of Yes. Yes. <laughs> that is a Nebraska thing. I don't even think we have those in Iowa. So I'm, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. So let's get a little bit into like your approach. It yeah. seems like we have more and more information out, whether it be social media, you can Google whatever you're looking for. for but sure. then in all the data we look at, people struggle more and more now with sticking to their, maybe not sticking to their goals, but staying in shape. You know, obesity is at a all time record high, it seems like. So what are some things, you know, it's like I mentioned in the open, it's a new year. Everybody had it seems like everybody sets their New Year's resolutions. Like I'm going to lose 10, 15 pounds, do whatever. I'm going to go to the gym. What are some things that people that don't live in this world can do to kind of kick off the new year? Right. Yeah. So. I like to work on this, these principles of what I call, and this is just something I've, you know, done, created in my practice called non-negotiables. And a non-negotiable is something that no matter where you are or what you're doing, it's something you're going to make a priority in your life. We do it all the time in our day. We don't think about it, right? I would say that most humans in this country brushing their teeth at least once a day is pretty much a non-negotiable for them, right? Adults, I don't know, kids may be different. But we just grow up and assume I have to brush my teeth every single day. That's just what we do, right? It's, it's almost like an, an understood expectation. I, I like to translate that into our own lives. And what are those non-negotiables for you or for me that will not feel like a diet or uh, a challenge or something that's unsustainable? So for example, eating a vegetable every single day is a non-negotiable in my life. Sometimes that's going to be the amazing vegetables I have in my kitchen that I get to prepare the way that I want them. And other times, if I was driving to Nebraska, it might be a McDonald's side salad. But the thread is the non-negotiable of I'm going to prioritize eating a vegetable every single day of my life. The same can be true for drinking water, right? I'm going to prioritize making sure that I never have less than X liters of water for whatever the person might be. These become foundations for us that keep us healthy and allow us to hit goals with even without a fancy diet, fancy supplements, you know, amazing trainer. 
So I think everybody needs to sit back and think about whether it's January 1st or July 1st or December 1st, what can happen every day that's going to help me hit those goals? And I do think eating vegetables needs to be there. I think that drinking enough water needs to be there. And I think that there has to be some perspective and and surveillance over our lifestyle, right? I have so many people who come to me and they'll say, I eat right and I do everything right and I work out six or seven days a week and like I can't hit my goals. And then when I start to dig a little deeper, you know, they're burning the candle at both ends. They're barely sleeping every night. They're going to bed too late. They're on their phone before they go to sleep. They wake up in the middle of the night, they're on their phone. Their stress levels are through the roof. And it's like we've we've done everything else that we could check the box to do, but we haven't gotten to the root of the inflammatory response, the stress response, and our environment that is so influential on our, on our wellness and our health. And is there something there too on somebody like that that's overly stressed out that even, you know, working out, training can be a stressor, mm-hmm. but that like certain people where actually less could be more? I mean, you I know, see that all the time, right? Like, you know, a few years ago, New York City went through this insane craze of fitness boutiques, right? Pre-pandemic, you know, the height of the Barry's boot camps and the soul cycles and all the things. And I would meet with these more women than men who would take on these 60 minute high intensity interval training classes, seven days a week, busting their butt and turn around and be like, I don't know why I'm not seeing more lean muscle definition. And it's like, well, there's no balance there. Yes, you're working out seven days a week. Yes, you're taking, you know, some sort of boot camp high intensity class, but there's nothing restorative. There's nothing built in. And it's about that balance, right? If you eat too many vegetables, Scott, it might not be great for you. It's about balance. It goes back to eating some, right? And so I think everything sort of goes to this extreme. So to your point, if you are overtraining, over exercising, whether you're well fed or underfed, it, it could absolutely be at the expense of your goals. And what are some other, like, I feel like that's maybe falls into one of those common myths that they'll eat less and train more and expect to see better results when that doesn't necessarily happen. What are some other like very common myths that you see that hold people back? Um, dehydration, overhydration, right? We've got the, this pendulum extremes of those people who walk around with like, you know, two gallon water bottles in the gym and they're filling it up and they're so overhydrated. And then we've got the opposite of someone who's like four cups of coffee, uh, barely drank any water, doesn't feel thirsty at all. And I think when we're really looking at how we feel, sleep, wellness, performance, goals, strength, lean muscle, adequate hydration is going to trump everything else in my book. Everything. It's going to take precedence over exercise, over food, over all of it. Um, sleep is going to be another one, right? And, and that's a tough one because anyone who's ever had insomnia or sleep problems listening right now is going to feel very angry at me for saying you've got to get good sleep because they're trying and they're not, I'm not necessarily speaking to that person, but to the person who's just staying up too late on their phone or waking up and, and working like sleep hygiene, temperature, of the room, like light, all of those things they make a huge difference in our recovery. Anyone wearing a whoop knows that you're, you're all of a sudden going to be looking at this band and seeing what the impact of your sleep is on, on your recovery and your function. So, um, that'd be another one. How important do you think, like for people that want to take it a little bit further, how important is like having people having regular blood work done to like achieving their overall goals? because I see a lot of people that will question, I try to have it done like twice a year Mm -hmm. and I'll have people question that like, doesn't that get expensive? Doesn't it do this? But my response is like supplements or whatever are expensive and it's just kind of, you know, shooting blindly if I don't know what's going on on the inside. Yeah, this is a huge topic and I'm glad to bring it up, but I don't know how far I'm gonna go down the rabbit hole with it. You know, blood work, can be as simple as checking something called like a CBC, right? Your complete blood count, which isn't going to tell us very much about your wellness goals. Blood work can be as extensive as the organic acids that break down nutrients in your body. So when someone says blood work, it doesn't give us insight into what that means. I think what what we want to think about is 
how important is it to have surveillance over your own body's function and nutrient status and performance-based metrics to help you hit those goals, make sure you're well, make sure you're you know healthy. Um, most routine blood work is going to make sure that you don't have kidney issues, liver issues, heart failure. Most athletes or wellness people in the wellness space aren't worried about those particular things, right? So we sort of have to, to separate. Then I'll have people who say like, you know, they want to do all this fancy blood work. And that is going to be insanely expensive for most people because there's, you know, without getting into insurance stuff. Um, and is it necessary? And more often than not, there's, it's not right. There are some things that we want to look at. Like I do recommend that people have their B12 checked, that they have their vitamin D checked, that they have their lipid panel checked, that they have an inflammatory marker of various different sorts. There's a few different, that their thyroid is checked, that their blood sugar and their, their insulin is checked. These are things that I believe should be routine um, blood work once a year. If you say, I feel better doing it twice a year. Okay. Um, those are routine things that can point us in the direction of where we would need to look further if there was something that wasn't normal. Now, if we start to spread that out and we get into different age demographics, right? Women going through menopause, they're going to have an additional couple of labs that might be really beneficial, beneficial for us to look at. Men having testosterone levels checked at a certain age can be really beneficial. Not everybody will have access to this. I understand. And for some people, it might be more expensive. That is true. Same can be said for food, quality of food that we eat. Same can be said for the quality of supplements, right? I, I have people all the time, they're taking fish oil. And I'm like, that's great that you're taking fish oil. We know how healthy it is, but I'd actually rather you stop taking that fish oil and not take fish oil at all than to take the one they're taking if the one they're taking is not a good source of fish oil, potentially contaminated with PCBs, toxins, not third party tested, right? Like I've had people come in with some of the most horrific supplement ingredients I've ever seen. And I'm like, this is actually harmful. And that's always tough because there's such little regulation on the supplements, mm -hmm. or at least for in a lot of them, I should say. So we've gotten exponentially better. We've gotten we've gotten exponentially better, not from the perspective of government surveillance, but from individual supplemental companies acknowledging and being aware of people wanting higher quality things, right? So you can now find a lot of supplements that are third party tested that have transparency around what they're made of and their ingredients. It's still the wild, wild west. It's still a billion dollar industry. And there's more crap out there than there is good for sure. Um, but what used to be harder to find has definitely now become more mainstream in being able to find something that is clean and doesn't have dyes and colors and, you know, sugars and ingredients that we don't need. It's, it's a lot easier now than it was 10 years ago to find something that it is going to be healthy and beneficial towards your goals. And I'm guessing I know the answer to this, that it's going to be what works for individual people. But like, how do you feel like about so many of the dogmatic approaches is you have to like, you know, there's the keto crowd, there's the high carb, low fat, the carnivore, you know, crowd. And to me, this is just my personal opinion is some of those are very hard to sustain. And you see a lot of people that maybe have done one of them lost 20 pounds two years ago, but now they're 10 pounds heavier than when they started that particular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that anybody that's out there that's listening and is, you know, following a keto diet or a liver diet or a paleo, whatever it is, right? This isn't to, to kick their their choice of treatment or their, their choice of, of plan, it's to acknowledge and bring awareness to the sustainability of it, right? And that goes back to the very first thing we opened up with, which is how to hit goals. It's about consistency. And is what you're doing something that you can be consistent on? And if the answer is no, then it's probably not the most rooted in health and wellness. Now then the counter to that, I will hear a lot of people say is like, well, I just need this to jumpstart. This is gonna help me get on track. Okay, possibly. But studies show us that behavior change doesn't come from that, right? It doesn't come from being put on track because usually the pendulum will swing back the other way. I 
every diet out there is rooted in truth. It's just how it's been exaggerated and extrapolated to make it saleable, sellable, popular, attractive, how to make it different, right? The keto diet is one of the most phenomenal treatment protocols for somebody with uncontrolled seizure disorders. It is in tremendous amount of validity in the science world around brain function and seizures. Most of the people who walk through my door on a keto diet are not truly keto. They're just high fat, low carb. They're not blood testing for ketones. They're not urine testing for ketones. They're not taking ketones to get through their workouts. They're not following it in that exact way. What they're doing is just bumping up their fats, drinking some bulletproof coffee, cutting out their carbs, you know, eating keto chocolates that are filled with fake sugars. Like this is the fancy media way of saying like, you can do this keto diet. It's not where keto was studied. And I'm not, you know, putting keto down in a way that if you fought, if you're on a keto diet, like I think less of it, it's that it's an, it's an attempt to create change in a way that we feel like we haven't been able to do anything else. People be like, well, nothing else worked. This is the only thing that worked. And that's, also usually not true. Um, but every diet out there is rooted in some truth. So let's find the truth. The truth is that cut, reducing your sugars and your carbohydrates can be incredibly beneficial to your goals, right? That would be a truth of keto. A truth is fat is a very important fuel source. Does that mean I want you melting butter in your coffee every morning? No, but it does mean that we want to reconsider how we use fats in your diet as, a, as an energy source. Let's go to a different diet. Let's go to a... Um, Mediterranean diet, or let's go to, you know, any of these, a plant-based diet. That's a huge controversial one. Like, yes, there's a tremendous amount of truth that an entirely plant-based diet is cardiovascular, is beneficial to the cardiovascular system, especially when you're comparing it to somebody who wasn't plant-based before. That doesn't mean it's the best diet out there. And, and so I think to answer your question, you know, there's not a single best diet, but there's a lot of best practices. My most recommended or favorite diet would be the Mediterranean. It has fat, it has meat, it has plants, it has some grains, it's highly unprocessed, it's more balanced, it's hard to follow in this country, right? It's different when, you know, if I spend a month in Greece the past few summers, it's not so hard to, to eat Mediterranean <laughs> when you're in Greece than it is when you're in New York City. Um, so, you know, to, to everyone who's just sort of trying to figure this out, like how can they be successful? If creating structure or avoiding things in your life helps you be more successful, then you have to lean into that. But does that mean you have to be extreme? Does that mean that you have to, you know, take it to that level where it's not sustainable? So when you're working with clients, you know, I read on your website where it's a highly individualized thing. So I assume you get to know them and figure mm -hmm. out what makes them tick from a mindset level. In addition to the, all the physical part of it, how many times, or do you think there's a lot of people like to try like the, I don't want to call them a fad diet, but like the popular diet that you see online or whatever it is right now, because that's easier than addressing like maybe some of the mindset stuff of why, you can't follow a particular plan. And I guess from your angle, how do you approach that with a client? Because I can't imagine that's an easy thing to say, because I, I would guess a lot of people are looking for a quote unquote quick fix. Well, I mean, in my private practice, I will give them the quick fix and I will also give them the truth underneath it and say, you know, here's your temporary. But if you want this to work forever, if you want to hit those goals, like here's the truth, right? So you hit somebody with the truth and you also give them what you want. The, the truth is going to last. They're going to come back and say, can we, can we talk about that? The other thing that you had, that you had topped on there. Um, listen, it's attractive, right? It's attractive to have something that we can grab and, and let's take it out of diet for a second, right? Like I, I'm going to be attracted to the newest trend in skincare. If some person comes on and says it made their skin look 10 years younger, even though it's probably not true. And I should just, you know, get better sleep and drink enough water and all the things like it doesn't mean I'm not going to be drawn to it. Wait, you mean I could look younger by using that serum? Like we're all susceptible to that. You then pair that with where you are in your own, uh, I, I want to say insecurities or questions or weaknesses or challenges, right? If, if you're struggling with 
strength or weight or skin issues and somebody has something that seems like, wow, that could really work well for me. Like I, I get it that we're all going to gravitate to that. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't, but, but what's underneath it, right? Like what do we need to look underneath it in regards to how we got to where we are or why we haven't been able to sustain behavior change in the absence of extreme diets? There are, there's so many iterations of that. Anyone listening, I want you to think about like, what is something I've been constantly trying to change for a year or two? And I haven't, I haven't hit it yet. I haven't been able to like, the answer is not finding something new. It's in understanding why you haven't been able to. I see this a lot with alcohol where people will go on a dry January. Probably a lot of people listening who are on a dry January right now and they feel great. And then February, they feel good too, because there's less and life gets in the way. And then all of a sudden we're back in July and it's like back to our, you know, drink daily. And every year they want to drink less. And I'm just using this as an example. So every year we go back to this, take it all out, take it all out. Let's just take it all out and I'm going to feel better. Okay. My approach is different. My approach is you feel better with less. Why don't we come up with a budget? Why don't we have a bank, right? You can't go and buy yourself crazy expensive toys every single day and still have money in the bank, right? Like there has to be some perspective of budget as an adult on our expenses. So why can't it be on our indulgences? So why can't, instead of you saying every January, I'm going to, you know, stop drinking. And I see a lot in September too, after the summer, people are like, Oh, stop drinking. What if we said, instead of that, what if I said for the next 52 weeks of the year, you're going to have no more than seven drinks a week. If you want to save all seven for Saturday night when you're going out with your friends, if you want to have one every single day or maybe two, two, you know, and three, what if, and and seven might feel like a tremendous amount to some people and it might feel like not enough to others. Everyone's (laughs) number is going to be different, right? New York City, that's a small number. What if we did that? And so instead of every January, you're trying to fix the same problem by doing the same thing. What if we completely changed it up? And that's sort of how I like to approach diet, strength, wellness, health, all the things, which is I'm not going to repeat what you've done over and over. I'm not going to give you a different fad diet because the previous fad diet didn't work. To me, it's a waste of your time and your money. And if any of those fads worked, they probably won't be coming into your office seeking your assistance. (laughs) I mean... Right. I always say if there was a book I I could write, if I, there was a wish, if I could, let me say that all over again. If there was any book I wish I wrote, it would have been the whole 30, right? Because at its core, it just challenged people to eat unprocessed for 30 days. It challenged people to say, hey, I'm going to stop having so many packages and sugars and things. Now the whole 30 today is a whole business. It's a whole fad diet. It's a whole operation. It's not what it was when it first came out, but at at its core, its principle was in seeing if we can create change in a way that's healthier. And how many times, like with your alcohol example, do you see when somebody, let's say they're having 21 drinks a week and they cut it down to, let's say seven or whatever the, the habit is that they try to change. But by just changing that one thing, it starts to trickle into all other areas of their life. You know, all of a sudden they're drinking more water. They're maybe eating just a little bit healthier, even if it's just one meal a day. But it it slowly starts to build just from changing one habit. I see it all the time. You know, I like using the alcohol bank as an example because it is so common for people to drink a lot of alcohol and not feel great and then want to stop drinking alcohol. And then they stop drinking alcohol, but there is something very social, comforting, exciting about drinking alcohol. So they go back to drinking alcohol and we never create that space in between. We live in the extremes. The alcohol bank allows for the space in between. I can go out with my girlfriends tonight and have a glass of wine and not feel like, Oh, I broke my dry January. Right. And, and this can be said for diet, for fitness, for all the things. It's not just alcohol, but it's, it's an easy example. Well, to your question about it, does that influence other behaviors? They didn't go and have 10 drinks tonight. So they didn't have missed their workout tomorrow morning. They didn't feel worse. They didn't put on more weight, which then made them think that they had to go back on another diet to lose the weight that they had from the drinking. So there's definitely a domino effect on both positive behavior change and negative behavior change. And nutrition is never just about food. There's not a single person 
that I've ever met in my 18 years of practice that didn't in some way tie their food to their social, emotional, psychology, family, nurture, culture, experience, because it's, it is part of that. So for someone to just eat blindly and routinely their chicken breast and broccoli and sweet potato every single day, like they're ignoring or denying a huge part of how they identify, how they function, how they feel, how they operate in the world. And you bring up such an excellent point of how such a social aspect there is or, you know, to eating or going out with your friends. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about it's much healthier to go out with friends and maybe not eat 100 percent to your plan than it is to stay in every night. And like you said, eat chicken and broccoli by yourself seven days a week Mm -hmm. and be completely miserable. But yet you're hitting your macros, whatever those might be. Mm hmm. And that's that flexibility piece, right? That's that idea of like, you know, we have to nurture our, it will call body, mind, spirit, body, soul, all the things, right? Like, yes, for a little while, you can ignore the others and just focus on body, but like we're human and most of us need nurture in all different areas and self nurture often comes from company, food, things around us. So to remove that and then think that we can sustain without that is not really true. So I think I, um, in following you online, I see that you have daughters, correct? I do. How do you approach like the nutrition and eating and everything with them? And, and I've, I question that because, you know, a lot of times you'll have people and I try to do the same, you know, kids will be kids, but knowing what you do about nutrition and food, how do you approach that with them? Like Mm -hmm. for that healthy balance? I don't think anyone has ever asked me that question. That's uh, thanks for asking. That's fun for me to talk about. Um, I'll I'll admit part of it's selfish. I have a 21 year old daughter that I've never had the right answer. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. 21, you might be, she might have to uh, do some of this on her own. Um, So contrary to what a lot of people think when they hear me speak or when they follow me on social media, like there's this idea of, I must always eat healthy. I must have a perfect diet. I must work out all the time. And like, it couldn't be further from the truth. Right? It couldn't be further from the truth that I don't have, you know, Kit Kats in my closet or miss a day of working out. And, and I speak to flexibility a lot. Um, so one of the things that has always been a principle in my life is helping people understand what makes them feel good and what doesn't and what they need and what they don't. So my children have never been denied an opportunity to try something, whether it's, you know, a candy, a, a soda, like, you know, that yes, just like every other kid, you know, they're going to pick pasta and chicken nuggets over every other food um, when they can. Growing up with them, one of the things that I've implemented is understanding how much they need. So if my daughter would take uh, Oreos out of the closet from, from early on, since from when she could read, I would say, well, what's the serving size of the Oreo? And I'd show her where it was and she'd say four Oreos. And I'd say, okay, well, you're half a human, so you get two, <laughs> right? And she would take her two Oreos and she'd eat her two Oreos and she'd be on her way. And that worked for many, many years. Now they're getting a little bit older and it's like, what if I want more? And it's like, okay, well, if you want more, are you hungry? Because if you're hungry, like, let's eat some food and then talk about it. So there's always been this perspective of like, why do you want it? What do you want? What do you need? What are you feeling? Um, Sometimes they'll say to me like, I'm hungry. And it'll be like nine o'clock at night. And I'll say, but you should eat more at dinner. If you're hungry right now, do you want to make an egg? And they'll be like, no. I'm like, I don't know if you're really hungry then. Or are you just (laughs) looking for something, which is fine if you are, but like, let's call it what it is so that they've started to create Um, their own identification of food that makes them feel good and both physically and food that makes them feel good emotionally, right? We grow, um, we have one of those arrow gardens in our kitchen and we grow vegetables and, you know, they don't like cooked vegetables. Many kids don't, they're only eight years old and many kids don't, but what they have found is that they like raw vegetables. So, you know, I'm not going to say you have to eat the soggy spinach or the soggy broccoli on your plate. I'll say, go get a scissor, cut off 10 leaves, pick the ones you want and eat them. And so there's, there's autonomy, 
but there's structure and there's guidance and there's choice. And I hope that that stays with them. So far it has. Um, but, you know, they also get to eat Halloween candy and they also get to eat, you know, we have dessert in my family every night. There's not a night that goes by that this family doesn't eat dessert. Myself, <laughs> my husband, the kids. Um, we just pay attention to balancing out the portion. You know, it's like, that's what it comes down to. Well, and I think that's important for people to hear both parents and just people for themselves that, you know, if they followed you or, you know, saw what you did for a living, they're probably like, oh, she, you know, never misses a meal or always eats healthy because that's so many times what we see on social media is, you know, this person is a hundred percent perfect when we know that's not really the case. Scott, many of those, this person is perfect are clients of mine and I've had them on my couch <laughs> and I will tell every single one of you listening that what is put out there is not necessarily the truth. We are all human, right? We all have our tendencies and our issues. And, you know, when you meet somebody who's so perfect, there's your red flag, right? Looks doesn't always match behavior and behavior doesn't always match the look, right? And I'm not saying that everybody's doing everything wrong, but like, there's no such thing as perfection in wellness. You can't have a perfect diet. You can't have a perfect workout. You can't have a perfect, it just doesn't exist. But that, that personification of it is so toxic. So if, if somebody wants to work with you, and they're not local to you, do you do online coaching with them? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, I do virtual visits. I do a lot of telemedicine, virtual visits. Um, and you know, I do a lot of social media stuff and, um, have some stuff coming out this year around like, you know, just helping people educate how to eat healthier. And a lot of the things that we just spoke about things like tendencies for the alcohol bank or, you know, tools that can help them. I think it's important to be able, my, my platform, if you will, is, is something I want to always be able to take the extreme and translate it to the real, right? So like, is keto the best diet? No. Are there aspects of keto that are good? Yes. Is, you know, does everybody need to go out and take like beef liver capsules? No. Is there an element of a beef liver capsule that's beneficial? Sure. We're talking about, you know, blood building and iron and like, so, you know, I, no one will ever stand in and replace the fad diets of the world. And I don't ever want to stand on a soapbox and be like, every fad diet is detrimental to your health. Because there are people who will say it was that diet that helped me, just like we talked about with, you know, less than the alcohol that helped me change my behavior around food. But I, I guess I, I sit here with you and speak to you about like your best space of change, your most intended outcomes and, and positive results are going to come not from the extreme, but from when we pay attention to what hasn't worked for us and the why behind it, not just what, but like why, and not to, to go down another rabbit hole, but I also think we need, we need as a community, as a whole, as a country to reevaluate expectation. I think social media has created this, expectation that is so wildly unreal of what we should look like, how we should perform, what we should be able to lift or to, right? And, and this idea that we should be able to do that in order to be good enough is also toxic in that space, right? Like compare you to you and nobody else and watch you soar. Compare you to another person and you've immediately lost. You've lost all your power, right? I, I say that all the time compare you to you and no one else. The other thing I say to people all the time is it's not what you do one day that matters. It's what you do most. So if you go out tonight and you eat, you know, too many pieces of chocolate cake at a party, like it's not today that matters. It's what we do most days. So you lose your power when you compare yourself to another person and you lose your power when you can't see the big picture and get stuck on the small, the small hang up. That's awesome. And, you know, even I've obviously following you on Instagram, I think today um, you were talking, you know, back to the whole thing you were talking about, like water, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and like the extremes of you talked about it earlier with water. But, you know, even that, how many people, you know, five years ago, we never saw anybody walk around with a two gallon jug of oh my gosh. water. And I personally, I mean, 
I'm 47, so I'm getting a little bit older. I don't know how they do anything other than go to the bathroom all day when they're drinking <laughs> two and three also, gallons of water a day. I also don't know at what point it became okay to stand at a water machine in a gym and fill up a two gallon of water. <laughs> I like watch the line like build behind this person filling their two gallon water. And I'm like, Oh no, this is a problem. Like, you know, to your point that you were just talking about, they see it, somebody else do it. And they're, you know, instead of just trying to do better themselves they are always comparing to what yeah. other people are doing. Yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time, like, Oh, what do you eat for breakfast? And I'm like, I'll tell you what I eat for breakfast, but that doesn't mean that's what you should eat. Right. But we, we want that. We want to be able to identify with others and, and sort of hear what they're doing. So if you're somebody who's listening, who does that, like, it doesn't mean you can't look at others for inspiration, but don't lose yourself in that process. I have a friend that's in the trainer business. And that's what he always talks about. He's like, everybody always wants to ask, what are your macros? What do you eat? And he'll say, those are completely irrelevant to you. We mm -hmm. have different stress levels, different, mm -hmm. you know, different training age, different muscle mass, different everything. He mm -hmm. said, so you could eat identical to what I'm eating and you may gain 20 pounds. You may lose 20 pounds. I don't know. Totally. Well, that's why I like to speak on the principles, the non-negotiables, right? Like everybody listening to this call, like there's not a single person listening that shouldn't eat a vegetable every day. You might not like them. Uh, you, I, I don't, wouldn't care if there was a caller who came in and said, but I'm on a blood thinner. I'd say, well, we still figure out what the right one is for you and what the right amount is. There's not a single person on this call who shouldn't eat a vegetable. I don't know. Maybe if you're like that all carnivore liver type person who believes there's lectins in them, I'm going to say that's a fad and that won't stick. And that's, gonna, <laughs> but like, you know, there's also not a single person on this call who shouldn't have a liter of water or more per day. Do you need two liters? Do you need three liters? I don't know. That depends on your body weight, your fitness, but like, most adult humans should not drink less than a liter of water a day. Somebody going to say, well, what if I have kidney? Okay. There's always somebody who's got a, you know, an outlying issue. You work around that. But when it comes to like the foundation, right? Like nobody needs to be drinking 30 drinks a week on a regular basis. Nobody needs to, you know, everybody needs to adequately hydrate. We do need to eat a vegetable every day. We do need protein in order to hit our goals. Next question. How much protein? I have vegans who have less. I have carnivores who have more. I, but like there are principles that will keep us in that space, right? I, I think if I could see one fad disappear, um, well, a few fads I'd like to see disappear, <laughs> but one of them would be this idea that carbs are bad. It, if you're an athlete, yeah, I don't necessarily want you eating a bagel every day. Right. Especially if you're in New York City, have you seen the size of a New York City bagel? <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but remember the carbs in fruit, there's carbs in right. So like we take these ideas and and we make them so crazy that how how the heck could you know what to eat? How could you know what's healthy? Right? Kale will kill you, kale is gonna save you. I could find you the, a post about that today. Both concepts. How does somebody reconcile that? Right? It's like all right, well, where does it come from? Where is it rooted from? There's truth and there's, and there's exaggeration. So the non-negotiables keep you in a space, right? It's reducing the alcohol. It's making sure you're hydrated. It's, I'm, I might, I might be a little controversial in saying this. That's fine. Like I'm not somebody who thinks that substituting healthy food with unhealthy chemicals, just because the numbers make it look better is a good idea. So you're not ever going to catch me telling somebody to have a keto sugar, uh, un, you know, a, a fake sugar, an artificial sweetener, a chemical coloring to make something like that to me is not health and wellness. And I think you can even see that now in like the gluten-free labeled stuff. Mm -hmm. If you look at the ingredients or look what it, I mean, it's, yeah. but it's people cash. buy it and eat it in the name of health when it's tip a lot of times anything, but health. And sometimes they're not. I mean, I've met people who are like, I don't care if it's healthy. I care if I hit my goals. I'm like, okay, we're just speaking two different languages. But if it's in, in search of, in root of wellness and health, like you got to be aware of what you're putting in your body, right? I'll, I'll call it out right now. Like when I see a parent giving a child a Centrum vitamin, right? We have a lot of studies that talk about the potential adverse effects of food dyes and food colors on children. This same company makes a, vit a chewable vitamin without food dye 
Why are we going with the one with the food dye? It's an education piece, right? We don't need that. We can get rid of that. It's going to be a lot harder to get rid of food dye in a Sour Patch Kid, but they're not having that every day. I hope maybe not. But in the multivitamin that they might be taking, we can make choices that are better informed and more in the service of hitting those goals. I think that that approach, I think, needs to be promoted more and more people need to hear your message because it's it doesn't sell as many uh, <laughs> shiny. <laughs> it, it might not sell as well, but <laughs> at least from where I said, it's so much more practical. And I think so many more people would feel better and be healthier without having to stress about it, like sticking to such, yeah. you know, uh, such routines, you know, and, and I speak from experience. I used to, I would do great at home where I could control everything, put me on the road for work. And it was like every single thing I had ever learned or practiced completely went out the window. Yeah. And, but it was that whole, I had to stick to my routine or nothing where I've gotten much better now that when I'm traveling, I do the best I can with what's available to me, but I don't stress. And when I get back home, I go back to my normal routine. I mean, you see all those like inspirational quotes about like, you know, the people that are most successful had to fail X amount of times before they were successful. Right. But then for some reason we can't, we can't let that resonate for ourselves in our, our routine. And it's okay if you don't, if you don't hit your exact needs or like for you on the road, right? Like you abandoned everything because you didn't have exactly what was versus what it would have been like to have a version of it, right? To have the McDonald's side salad to get that vegetable instead of having no vegetables at all because you would never eat that, right? It's it's the dogma, it's the, the, the extremes that put us in positions where we can't make the best decision. And I felt guilty of that for far too long. Fortunately, I've learned that it's not the end of the world, but I, yeah. I did fall guilty to that. And I know you are a very busy person, so I'll let you go. But I do have one more question. Yeah. On, on your website, you have one of my favorite quotes by Viktor Frankl mm -hmm. that says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. It's my favorite and, quote of all time. And I know that can apply to so many areas, but I feel like that could sum up the nutrition, health, wellness space in so many ways. But how, why does that quote resonate? And why is it your favorite quote? For exactly what you just said, you know, I need something sweet. I need to have, you know, a soda right now. Do I, or do I need to have some seltzer, walk away, take a few breaths, come back? Do I need this or do I want it? Do I, am I reacting to something and, and choosing something that isn't actually what I need and what I want? And I'm just choosing it because I'm in a reactive state. And what happens if I take a step back, right? In wellness, in health, in all the things, like between that stimulus and that response, the stimulus is like the immediate and the response is our opportunity. It's our opportunity to say, yeah, I do want the soda. In which case you should drink the soda. But if that same opportunity, that same stimulus is happening every single day, is it that you really want it, right? And so the quote is, the, you know, it's a long quote, but what it does is it speaks to our internal innate power to choose. And if we slow down for a second, and if we stop and just think, what is it that I actually want? Am I bored or am I hungry? Am I stressed or am I thirsty? Am I anxious? Or am I angry? Am I right? Am I shaky because I, my blood sugar is low or am I shaky because I'm anxious? Like when we stop for a second and we ask why the innate ability to answer that question lies within all of us easier for some who have a little bit more self-awareness than others, but we can all do that. And if we stop and do that, in your wellness and in your health, if you, before you buy the fad diet book, if you said, what if I did a few principles of this, whatever it might be, so much change will come from that space in between. It's even like what you're teaching your daughters at, yeah. you know, at night, that awareness piece, you know, am I really hungry mm -hmm. or do I just want a snack? And both answers are okay. But are you acting on it without asking yourself the question? And I do this with my clients all the time. And most of the time they'll say, wow, 
sometimes I really want it and I have it. And other times I'm like, oh, I, I was hungry and I had something healthy, right? Like, I know we're going to end in a minute, but one of the things I see all the time is people who sit on their hands to try not to eat something. So they'll go into the kitchen and, well, I'm just going to have um, a grape because I don't want to have candy. And then I'm going to have a bite of a rice cake because I don't want to have something sweet. And then I'm going to have, you know, a little bit of Cheerios. And, and they wind up going back and having something and something and something and something else and ultimately end up having the one thing that they were trying not to have. Right? And I'm like, so you had 17 other foods before you had the Oreo because if we, but if we would have asked ourselves, is it really the Oreo? We might have been able to have the Oreo and not have tried to circumvent it and had 17 other things. And you mentioned it earlier about dessert every night, but isn't that kind of the same principle? You said you have, I've heard you say you have ice cream every night. Mm -hmm. Is every it night. just mainly for that reason to prevent that? It's because I know I have worked, you know, my own self and my own, you know, regulation of appetite. Like there's something for me that ending my dinner with something sweet feels like closure. Feels like I'm done. I had my dinner. I had a bite of dessert. It's closure for me. That bite of dessert for me is one scoop of a mint chocolate chip Turkey Hill ice cream. It's not any organic, whatever, whatever. No, it's like literally Turkey <laughs> Hill mint chocolate chip ice cream. I'll insta story it for you tonight. And just so everybody believes me. And it's a one spoon of it. And like, I'm like, oh, that was delicious. That was sweet. I'm good. I'm done. When I don't have that or some version of it, I tend to feel like I still want something right now. If I'm going to go back and have a bite of pineapple and I'm going to go back and have a bite of it, I'm going to keep going to try and get to that thing where I could just have it. It takes a self-awareness practice to do that. Not everybody's going to do that because some people are going to say, oh, if I have a bite, I'm going to eat the whole ice cream container. In the beginning, you might. <laughs> Well, this has been absolutely awesome. I think this is very beneficial for a lot of people. I know it's been very helpful to myself as well. Where can people find you to, you know, to follow like so much of your practical advice and learn more about you? Um, right now, I would say just Instagram is where I'm putting the most content out. It's, you know, just trying to put it all into one space so people aren't all over the place. I have a website, but it's linked to my Instagram. Um, my Instagram is just Jamie Shear. The spelling is hard. When I made it 10 years ago, I probably should have thought about that, but I didn't. Um, so it's J-A-I-M-E-S-C-H-E-H-R. And if you just find me on Instagram, um, you can go, you can connect to my website from there. And I try and reply to all my DMs as much as I possibly can. Um, I will be having some really cool things launch in the next month, two or three around exactly what we're talking about. Not fad diets, but just sort of where people can learn more um, and putting up some videos and things. So yeah, I mean, follow me there and, and connect to me on social. And um, hopefully Scott will get to do this again. This was awesome. Yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank you for everybody listening. And as always, if you have any questions, hit us up at podcast at volcourtson.com.